What this episode offers you is how humor helps us, how helping other people helps us, and you find when you help other people and bring humor into that, you heal yourself. Korea, North Korea, Vietnam, Burma, Cambodia. You went to all these places? Yes. Why? I'm, well, it's, it's what I do, it's the work I do. What, what is uh, the work you do? Well, <laughs> What are you doing? I'm an, Who are you? I'm an activist. What am I doing in I'm this I'm an house? activist. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why you're here. I came home and I saw all these lights. I was in Vietnam in 1969 and 1970. Um, I was with the infantry. I was a forward observer for the infantry, which meant I called in artillery, airstrikes, and gunships during combat, firefights. I'm a family doctor, Okay. then I became an emergency room doctor. I was in the Cambodian invasion in 1970, May of 1970. I was in the lead helicopter that went in there. Since I was in a kid, I've been volunteering, whether it was, you know, in my local school, my local church, high school, college. You know, I had a great mother. I'm really just trying to be my mother. Then when I got into medicine, I decided whatever else I did in life, I would also give so many weeks a year to serving people in need. I don't think on my, that I've ever done any more than my mother did on her day-to-day -day basis as a school teacher or a friendly person. Art, you've seen a lot of people die. Yeah. Did laughter help you during any of that time? Uh, it's pretty painful if you don't. Do we have to know misery to know joy? Absolutely not. What a bunch of hooey that is. You know, I only knew joy because I grew up with a loving mother. You've got to do something to get your mindset out of death uh, and uh, the effects of people dying around you, friends dying around you, of people getting maimed or even worse because they've got to go live with those missing limbs the rest of their life. My father is a, is a retired pastor and he was the guy in town that everyone knew that if uh, you needed 20 bucks or you needed a meal, go to, go to JV's house and uh, knock on the door and he'll take care of you. My dad always did. And it was an example to me and so I, I decided I'm going to take care of people in need. I have been to war zones and refugee camps and starvation and because of my own father's death when I was 16 from war, I've studied the human condition. The laughter is often gallows humor, <laughs> but it's, there is humor. But you guys are in a gallows situation. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's literally a life and death situation every minute of every day. I clown for a better world because I want to end violence and injustice. I've been Blessed to have so many opportunities and it turned into an organization called Heart to Heart International now that serves in a, we've, we've worked in 150 countries around the world. Is that right? A very large, uh, wonderful humanitarian organization. There were all kinds of red ants, so you kind of learned how they burrowed. So you know, do things stupid like putting lighter fluid down and lighten your lighter fluid so you can give hot foot to a guy 10 yards away. <laughs> He's walking along barefoot, all of a sudden a flame comes up and shoots him in the foot. So I wouldn't call that, I'd say that's probably pretty visceral humor. Yeah. But, but, uh, but I think we'd, we would do just about anything to take, the, take our minds off. Typhoon uh, Haiyan, which in the Philippines they call it Typhoon Yolanda. But it's basically a hurricane. And uh, this typhoon is the highest, strongest uh, typhoon on record in history. And it struck the Philippines, heart to heart. What we do is we send doctors, medical teams, nurses, volunteers that go over. We set up clinics, triage, take care of people that are injured. We'd pile into a van, our van that we had rented, five medical team, all of our medicines. Then we'd pile in. I remember one day we had 18 total, 13 other people. What did those 13 people have? They weren't medical. They had guitars. They had little drums. And while we would set up taking care of patients, they'd be starting a street party with the kids. What a great idea. I mean, in the middle of a disaster, just think about it. Wow. Your kids, children are disrupted their lives. They don't have school. They don't have the, the normal grandparents and the attention of their parents to take care of them. Everything is disrupted, and the kids are just, like, lost. And so they would create a, a big street party while we're seeing patients. We did things to diffuse the tension, and, like, is usually involved a new guy. If you're a new guy coming into an infantry company. Is that an FNG? Yes, <laughs> FNG. Just something to get people's mind off of, uh, of, the, of the tragedy at hand. In my unit, we had a, uh, a monkey, and uh, the monkey was our mascot. He actually went out and patrol with us. A real monkey? Well, a real monkey, yeah. Uh, we'd find him in the jungle, and he just became part of our, our group. Whenever there's a major disaster in the United States or anywhere in the world, heart to heart will be there. We always told the new guy, 
your mission is to keep this monkey alive because this monkey is the good luck token of the, we were called the wolfhounds, of the first wolfhounds. That monkey dies, the wolfhounds die, so you gotta keep it alive. What we didn't tell you about the guy was a monkey. <laughs> He'd ride on your shoulder, and, you're, and so you had whatever you did, that monkey had to stay on your shoulder. We you didn't know the guy was a monkey, would ride on your shoulder, lean an inch a little closer, an inch a little closer, and get next to you, turn and face your ear. And <laughs> <laughs> I've clowned in 68 countries and people everywhere are beautiful. I've probably been at 10,000 deathbeds as a clown. You know, I've seen a lot of horrible things and in a given moment people want to enjoy, even at a horrible moment. So the new guy always got an earful. <laughs> I'm not about funny. I love funny. You know, how many starving children do you need to hold in your arms before you either, you know, crumble or become apathetic. So I'm here to do something. Well, the problem with Vietnam veterans, or what happened to Vietnam veterans, is when we came home, you couldn't talk about it because nobody wanted, they hated the war so much, and they hated us. With our clown trips, I want to submit people to the nightmare of poverty and have them weep over it and suggest that, you know, if you don't like it, why don't you work to change it? By example. The hundred people that, from 14 countries that paid to go to the Amazon, they paid a lot of money to work their butts off. It wasn't a day of vacation. It was horrible setting, a dangerous setting, uh, and the trip is a raw care for others. That's the ethic. Get up, go out there and love people and work. Work hard all day long for love. And it, the experience of it, is intoxicating. It gives meaning. And we have lost meaning because you only get meaning from giving love, from helping. I came back from Vietnam in November of 1970. And uh, Mizzou was... Uh, playing KU in the last football game of the season. They took love to suffering. And when they see themselves, when a human sees themselves relieving suffering, that's a high. And Mizzou scored and then fired a can and I jumped down the bleachers, you know, and I, was, I, was, I thought it was incoming. And I, mean, I was literally 48 hours out of combat when I, that, when I got there that day. Because they, there was no transition, it was boom, buddy, you're out and go Who home. Who were you with there? My, my wife and some of my old fraternity did, brothers. Did, were they shocked by you doing that? Or they, <laughs> What's he doing down the, in the bleachers? Yeah, they're kind of shocked. You know, not, not a lot of people do that during a football game. In the emergency room, how do you use humor? First of all, I, there, there are some situations that are so tragic and serious, you, you know, this is, that is not the appropriate time. We went to a party that night, and, uh, and everybody was doing what they did with that in the 70, 1970, which was getting stoned and being profoundly philosophical, you know, about everything. And so one of my best friends said, he says, man, he said, did you kill any women and children when you were over there? And I said, well, you know, there were firefights in which women and children were killed. And I said, but certainly wasn't our objective to kill women and children. He said, how could you do that? I mean, you've changed. How could you possibly do that? And I said, you know, until you're in a situation, I said, when somebody's shooting at you, you either take them out or that you go home in a body bag. It's not a real cerebral thought process. And he said, well, I wouldn't do that. And I said, you have no idea what you would do until it happens to you. Right. I hope it never happens to you, you know. So that night, I said, that's the last time I were talking about that war. I didn't want to in the first place. There are times when I've been with families and I've been joking, if it's, if it's something minor, yeah. and I can make a joke out of it. I didn't talk about it until 1985 when I started working on the Kansas City Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And then I was with other Vietnam veterans, and so we started talking about it. But during that 15 years, I had nightmares virtually every night of my life. Years ago, he came into my office with a little lesion, and uh, I knew him, he was a friend of mine, and I just looked at him and I said, well, you know what? Probably cancer. Just joking. <laughs> you know, and he still tells that story. You know, and it's like, you know, that you don't joke about cancer, but I knew it was nothing. And I knew I could cure it. It was ringworm or something. I was able to function. You know, I mean, it, it gives you a sense of, um, it gives you a sense of a, a resolve and a reservoir of, of energy and capability to get through things you, you never get over. It's like when I went to law school after I got out of the Army. 
Uh, first semester is, especially back then, law school was very, very, very intense, very hard, very competitive. They were trying to wash people out. I remember the, the night before our first final exam and everybody was like freaking out. And I was sitting there thinking, you know, I got a roof over my head. Nobody's <laughs> shooting at me. This ain't too bad. <laughs> you know? There's an important thing there, Gary, too. You also knew him. Yeah, I knew him. Yeah, and he yeah, knew yeah, you. Yeah, yeah exactly. He, so you guys had a yeah. relationship. And I didn't wait very long. It wasn't yeah. like I sent him out, you know, and he's going home and telling his wife. No, it was just a quick, uh, quick thing. And you would never do that to a stranger. That you oh, knew absolutely him. not. The way I, I even met Heart to Heart, uh, I had a law partner who was in... Uh, uh, Hanoi. He did international adoptions. He was Catholic. There's one Catholic church in Hanoi. This is 1994. And uh, so he was going to church on a Sunday morning. This woman was kneeling in front of me. He finally looked at her and said, aren't you Mother Teresa? She goes, yes, I am. He said, started talking to her and she said, where are you from? He said, I'm from some place you've never heard of before, Kansas mm -hmm. in the United States. She goes, oh, do you know Dr. Gary Morse and Heart to Heart? You have a great sense of faith. You were raised by a preacher. Uh -huh. how, do the, how does the faith come in with the humor? Well, some of the, the, the greatest saints that I've known actually had a, a great sense of humor. Mother Teresa. Now, you did work with Mother Teresa. Yes, I've worked with her, and she was a very, she was a very strong will, strong-minded person, and she was also quite funny sometimes. See, Gary, i got to tell you, I've talked to a lot of people, but I've never said... So tell me a funny Mother Teresa well, story. <laughs> so Gary is feeling very doctorly, and he's got a stethoscope around his neck, and he's with Mother Teresa, and she wants him to go down to one of her, uh, her missions, a hospital. And Gary's saying, okay, I'll go, do, I'll go be the doctor at the hospital. And she gives Gary a note, and Gary can't read it. You know, it's an Indian, he can't read it. So he takes it down to uh, give it to the head person at the hospital, the uh, head nun. And so she looks, reads the note from Mother Teresa, says, oh, come with me. So Gary goes in, they take, and he walks through the children's section. He goes, oh, I've done a lot of pediatrics in my life. This is perfect. What, what do you want me to do? She said, no, no, back here. Walk through, and they walk into his women's section. He says, oh, I've delivered a lot of babies. And, and they said, no, no, that's not it. But he goes through another ward, and finally he goes into the kitchen. And he goes, oh, Mother Teresa has it all wrong. She said, I, I can't cook. I'm a terrible cook. No, that's not it. They go back out the back door of the kitchen, and there's this pile of five feet of garbage. And the nun says, here's the shovel, there's the bag, we want you to move the garbage down one block. <laughs> Mother, Mother Teresa was teaching Gary humility. I would get letters. She would send a letter occasionally. To you? To me, maybe a couple times a year. And it would always be typed on an old-fashioned typewriter, because I could tell, because it was faded, the ribbon was fading, and the E was always kind of turned a little bit. And so uh, I decided I was going to bring her a laptop and a printer. There's this guy, Gary Morris, you got to meet, and he wants to meet you because he's talking about a Vietnam mission, he wants to talk to you about heading up. So I brought it all the way with me to Calcutta. I was so excited I was going to give this to her, and, I was, and it was going to be my gift to help her be more effective, efficient. So I go to breakfast, and uh, and uh, and Gary talks to me about going back to Vietnam. I said, yeah, my year in Vietnam, my year of getting divorced, two of the best years of my life. I can't wait to <laughs> go back to either one, Gary. Thanks. It's a great idea. Thank you. And so I sat down with her and her sisters. I said, Mother, I have something for you. It's really going to help you. This is a computer, laptop, and here's the printer. And I said, it'll replace your typewriter. And I said, the thing is, you can, when you put an address in, you can save it, and then you just hit a button, and it'll type it out. And I'm going... I've been charged with getting, you know, an airplane full of stuff over to Vietnam. Nobody wants to go there. She says, I don't want it. And I said, well, what do you mean you don't want it? Don't you understand? This is going to, you're going to have more time to serve the poor. You're not going to have to spend as much time. You and your sister's typing letters. This is really good. She goes, no, I don't want it. I had a guy in my committee uh, who was uh, uh, now a Jesuit. He's now a Je teaches philosophy at Rockhurst. He used to be one badass Marine colonel. And I was really getting frustrated. I said, well, I thought, what do I say to her? I said, it's steward good stewardship. You know, that's a biblical yeah, term. Sure. You should, you should use the tools that are available <laughs> so you can you do more. I said, you know, we're trying to find a way to, to, to uh, uh, get this stuff over there. He said, well, I can call Freddie, uh, Freddie Smith. I said, Freddie Smith, like FedEx Freddie Smith? He goes, yeah, we were platoon leaders together in Vietnam. Oh, my God. I said, seriously? He goes, yeah. Finally, she goes, okay, 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 I'll take it. And then she goes, but I'm going to sell it and take the money and buy food for the poor. So he writes in this typical Marine letter, 
hey, Freddie, I got a little favor. <laughs> you know, I want you to fly a bunch of stuff to Vietnam and to Hanoi. Can you do that for me on a FedEx plane? And Fred goes, Semper Fi, buddy. That sounds like a great mission to me. She was single-minded. I mean, she was ferocious. He would ask, you know, when, when I went to her with the idea of bringing some medicines, and I thought, I don't want to fly a plane load of medicines here and have her say, we don't want it. Yeah. And uh, somebody walked in, because this was always in kind of a courtyard where people were coming and going. It was always noisy. And one of the sisters br had brought in a tattered box, and then I could tell it had some samples of medicines. She goes, we just received these from somebody, of one of the Rotarians here in Calcutta, some medicines. He goes, is this what you, this is what you're talking about, these medicines? I said, yes, mother. We want to bring, but a whole lot. You know, we're just going to get a whole plane load. And she just couldn't believe it. She goes, well, you know, that's more than I'll ever need. Can we, can we share them with, with uh, other people and other hospitals? Wow. I said, of course, wow. that's the whole point. So she's right off the bat, she goes, we'll send them all over India. FedEx has been Heart to Heart's partner ever since. It's flown every mission that, that, that is because of this Marine uh, who was on, on our committee. She goes, how do you get all those medicines? Where, how do you get them? And I'd heard her so many times when people say, how does this happen? And she goes, I just pray. I just pray. <laughs> she was saying, how do you get a plane? So much medicine is donated. And I said, Mother, we just pray. <laughs> and, you know, she's kind of went, <laughs> okay, I understand. <laughs> she got it. She got it. <laughs> she got it. In April of 1995, uh, a FedEx plane landed on the tarmac of, of the Hanoi airport. And it was flown by... FedEx, Fred Smith had to, actually had to have a lottery among all his pilots because there's so many combat veterans who wanted to fly into Hanoi and land and not drop bombs because they'd only seen Hanoi through bomb sites before. And so the two pilots that landed there, Gary and I and Kit Bond were standing on the tarmac with like the Prime Minister of Vietnam. The FedEx plane comes in and lands. It's a historic time. And so we go up in the plane. FedEx pilots have tears coming down their cheeks. They can't believe they're now about to be captured and taken away, you know, landing in, in Hanoi. You know, when I go around walking, I, my clothes are, as I said, usually much wildly colorful than this. And just walking around as an older person with a twinkle in their eye and smiling and singing and generally being friendly is a giant part of clowning. You can't take yourself too seriously no matter how important you think you are to a certain situation, whether it's in the middle of a disaster and you're taking care of injured people, whether it's in a combat zone and you're taking care of soldiers, you've got to realize, you know what, you've got to have a break. Gary and a gal named Barbie Moore and I went to a leper colony outside of Saga. I mean, literally, you have to go to this island and these people are not allowed off the island. What's your juice, Gary? Why do you do that? Well, it's why... It's probably, you, you, I could probably ask you the same question. Why do you do what you do? It's, it's, it's who you are. It's your calling. It's your passion. It's what you have. It's your purpose for being here. These kids had learned a song in English, you know. These kids who have no life and no future, ever, learned a song in English to please us. It comes from my faith. Gary and, um, and Barbie were with their chieftain who was dying. Of, he had everything. He'd had a stroke. He had... Uh, any disease you can imagine, leprosy of course. It comes from my family, the way I was raised. They sat there in a tent with me praying for him. And even though he knew that they didn't necessarily share, well, they didn't share the same faith, didn't know if they share the same God. It comes from my life experiences. You could see him light up from the power of the prayer that they were saying for him. It's an amazing moment for me. It really is the moment I began to believe in religion again. And uh, I started to come back and trying to learn uh, more about faith. I want to die broke, burnt up, burnt out, and spent on behalf of the people on this planet. With meaning, you get instant meaning as soon as you care for another person. It's about serving people, giving of your time, talent, and treasure to make the world a better place. Yeah, I was going to this, this little clinic where uh, there were doctors and kids and everything, so I had a, a, a bag of medicines heart to heart given me. I didn't know what I was doing, I was just walking around being escorted by two doctors and a heart-to-heart -heart staffer. And this one doctor took me in a room and there was a little boy sitting there who was distended stomach and he was, his father was there and I said, what's wrong with him? He said, he's got this disease and he's got this infection and he's dying. And I said, why is he dying? Why don't you give him something for it? He says, well, all we have is these French herbal medicines. He showed them to me and I said, well, I got a bag full of stuff here. He looked at me and he says, this is the antibiotic we've been looking for. He turned to the father and he said, uh, 
your son's going to live. And the doctor and he and I all started tears running down our cheek. You know, and for me it was that cathartic moment because in that very place is where I'd been bringing death for a year, and now I was bringing healing. It was it was like the light switch went on, and my nightmares went away, literally that day.